anybody have a question they'd like to ask or uh, um, something that's been said that prompted something you want to know more about? Yes. And I'm going to repeat all the questions when they're asked so everybody hears them. I'd like to hear each of your experience in this particular play, which really moved me. So the question... you identified with it and what your personal experience was? The question is about the play that we're doing here, Heroes, and what their experience is like doing that and how it's moved them and their personal experience with that. Well, uh, I, 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 I don't, that's an easy one for me. Uh, I've worked with Ken a, a lot, but I've never worked with Ray, but I've seen Ray, and when David told me that, that these were possibilities, I thought, oh my God, how, how everybody's gonna say, how did you do that to get get the three of us together? Uh, and it is, it's been uh, the, one of the warmest and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, exploring kind of thing that you do with uh, with each of our characters. Uh, uh, that's uh, and, and we're still doing it. We're mm. still finding new things all the time, uh, uh, and and getting each other's rhythms, knowing how yeah. what we're like, and 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 to really listen, you know, to really listen. Uh, an answer from what you hear yeah. uh, uh, and it's been an incredible experience I haven't one of the most you know, That's not yeah nice. just one well I've worked with Ken but I've never worked with Jonathan I've heard about him and that was exactly I nothing to add to that exactly right just wonderful experience yeah. it was uh, not mentioning that when we were talking earlier about mentioning names and all that but and I remember I came out with a real nasty comment. I said, "I said, David, let's 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 get someone in there who's interested in doing the play, and not <laughs> doing a performance." We had talked about another actor, and Ken was like, "Who's who's a well-known actor?" Yeah. But the idea was to get actors that wanted to really work on the play and not have it be about them. How yeah. disappointed you are. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have a dream. And they don't always come through. <laughs> no, but, but it, you know, and that, that in the incredible thing, John, John thing bringing up, it, it takes a couple performances after you've learned the lines and all that, and with an audience out there a couple times before you really start really listening to one another and hearing what the other person is And looking at each other's saying. eyes. I mean, now it's at that point where you just look at each other and now yeah. it's a symbiotic thing, you know. It's, it's also the fact that we know each other, you know, and it's yeah. it's a lovely thing. It's, mm. it's a wonderful, it's a friendship. It's a, you know, it's good. The trust. Mm. Yeah, trust. Right. Yes. Uh, the warmth came across in the performance. I was fortunate enough to, to see and feel and experience it, and it was there. Mm -hmm. And the respect, it just mm -hmm. was. Well, you give us a, a, a lot too, yeah. you know. Oh, absolutely. The, the, the mean, comment was that the war warmth came across in the performance and that the respect could be felt by the audience. Yeah. I think that's the audience we know here <laughs> is a listening audience. Mm. Uh, I think the way audiences have become most of the time, they go to see exploding scenery and the dances and turns upside down and all that. And, uh, and the thing about coming to hear a story and seeing is to go for the actors. Didn't, the scenery didn't matter. You were going to hear a play spoken by some actors and that was the thrill, you know. Yes. I have a couple questions. Um, first, we saw the play Saturday and really enjoyed it. So it was a wonderful <coughs> play. Um, my questions are for Ken. Um, have you been to the New Guthrie and what do you think of the New Guthrie? And the second question is, my daughter and her husband are actors at the Guthrie and they're currently rehearsing for a Christmas Carol. And I just wondered, have you ever performed at the Guthrie and Christmas Carol. So the, the questions are for Ken about the Guthrie Theater and wondering whether Ken has been to the new Guthrie that's been built and that uh, your 
it's daughter your, and son your daughter and son-in-law are, are actors at the at the New Guthrie rehearsing in Christmas Carol and wondering whether Ken has ever been in Christmas Carol. I can't think what remember the first year of the Christmas Carol. I spent it, I forgot. We had some plague in Minneapolis. And I remember I was I was in the hospital. I was in a in a FBI ward in the <laughs> hospital where they hit people. And uh <laughs> I remember they said, when you're there, read this script. This is for the Christmas Carol. And I remember reading it the first time, and I told Barbara Field who wrote it. I said, well, Barbara, number one, I don't think it's about Christmas. You forgot about Christmas somehow. Nobody's mentioned Christmas in here once. And then she said, you're kidding me. I'm going to read. You're right. How did I do that? And, but I've never been in it there. I've been in, in it at uh, ACT, and I narrate one um, that David Hay, where's David Hay teach here? Uh, Walnut USD. Creek. Yeah, well, he teaches there, but he does one in Walnut Creek that I've been the narrator of for, I think, 16 years. I finally saw it for the first time. <laughs> and I said to him, how did you do that? How did you, because I was amazed at my performance, not having seen the show, <laughs> how the narration, he said, I just listened to you doing it that first time you taped it, and that's how I did it. I said, that amazed me. Mm -hmm. But the Christmas Carol, may, I'll tell you a Christmas Carol story. I told you about the um, Glass Menagerie. That was professional theater. In grammar school, must have been fourth grade, there was a little touring production of the Christmas Carol came. And that was like the first time I saw real action that they were kids, you know, touring. And I remember it, it said it was written by Eugene O'Neill Jr. <laughs> I remembered that. A thousand years later, I'm in New York, walking down Third Avenue about two in the morning, and some drunk hustles me for some money for a drink. And I said, I don't have any money. I'm an actor. I just, he's, you're an actor. He said, I'm a bad playwright. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so he said, I'm going to walk with you. Can you hold me up? And we're walking. And then uh, he said, I write plays and all that stuff. And, uh, and, and, and jabber, jabber, jabber. And, you know, he asked me what my first name was. And I asked him what his name, first name was. And his, he was Eugene O'Neill Jr. <laughs> And he took me for a drink then. We found some sleazy bar, and I told him the story of seeing that play. When I remember he broke down and cried. He said, at least somebody knows that I wrote them. I just never forget that. Have you been in the New Guthrie? I can't go back there because I do not want to look and see that that space is gone, that theater, which meant so much to me, so much to me. And um, I'll probably break down for the 50th anniversary if I'm invited. <laughs> yes. I wonder if you might share with us uh, individually um, what has been most satisfactory, most enjoyable about being actors. I'll answer that. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I have to go back a little bit. I, I once um, went to see a therapist, and he said, uh, we talked about acting, obviously. He said, well, why do you act? I said, oh, well, I, I love all the the great literature you, you touch, all the great characters that you've come in contact with. He said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? He said, he said you told me when you were a kid, you used to do imitations, and your parents laughed, and your uncles laughed, and patted you on the head. That's why you want to be an actor. I don't think he was completely right, but he was partially right. You get praised for something. I said, oh, they laughed, or they, they complimented me. I should do that, maybe. You know, and that fed, of course, the desire to be an actor. So, in in one way, yeah, uh, that feeling of being 
on stage and sharing something with people. I think that's, uh, and now the older I am, it, it gets better for me. It's much better for me. It's not so much about me. It's about um, relaxing and enjoying the character and enjoying the play. And if you enjoy it, of course, I want you to enjoy it and get it, the most out of it. But it's, it's not like, oh, love me, love me, please, you know, uh, adore me, <laughs> you know, praise me, tell me how, what a wonderful actor I am. I know I'm a wonderful actor. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. Uh, you become generous when you're older. You do, you really become generous towards fellow actors, towards the audience, to the play, everything. It's a nice feeling. So there are some advantages to being older, uh, you know. I think, I, as I said at the beginning, the first thing I wanted to be was a priest. And I still think when you're at your best and doing some role you really love, there is something in there about curing somehow. Mm -hmm. And I always feel it's about telling you it's all right. There's a way out. I'm a, back at ACT in those days, I remember doing the Tempest there, Prospero. And I got this letter from a woman saying she just had been diagnosed with cancer that afternoon and been given like a couple months to go. And she went out, she said, I had a couple of drinks. I didn't know I was thinking of suicide. And I'm walking down here mm -hmm. and she said, I'm gonna go to the play. And she came to see The Tempest. Yeah. And she said, the last five minutes of that play changed my life. I'm still here to write this letter. I'm doing my chemo, I'm fine. And that's, you wanna do those things when that happens. It doesn't happen too often that you can cure somebody but the theater does somehow. And that happens, I think, to us at various moments, that understanding, like some people work for laughs. I love yeah. silences. When you can hear that, you feel that somebody's, they're really, for something, maybe you don't even understand what you did, but they're, oh yes, that's what that means. Might be just that. Mm -hmm. Someone doing that, and you go, oh, Jesus, that's so beautiful. I did a play called The Catonsville Nine, mm -hmm. which was, the, the, the play was the transcript of the trial. The Berrigan brothers were in Connecticut in jail every night when we went on stage. And you, it, it was almost a religious experience. These two priests with seven other people were locked up for pouring animal blood over draft records. And... Um, Rehearsing it was interesting too. I remember leaving rehearsal once and I must have had an aura around me, literally. I walked down the st along the street and some guys in a car came towards me and I, I sensed the danger in a way. They're gonna pick on me or something. Like I, I how's it going, man? <laughs> and I got a positive image instead of, you know, and I, and not like Olivier passing the nuns, but two women passed me also, and they sort of went around me, you know, had this aura around me. You know. But every night we held hands just before going on stage, a moment, a minute of silence. And I felt truly I was doing something, you know. And acting, it's make believe, and it's for you, all sorts of other, but I really felt I contributed something, you know. I was. I was a surrogate. We are actors, we're surrogates. We represent ideas and people and places and things. And I was representing one of the Bergen brothers who was a holy man, a spiritual man. And every night there was a wonderful feeling. I, f I really felt I was doing something, you know, not just being a fictitious character. Did you do it with Eddie Flanders? Or? No, I didn't, no. He did it, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Jonathan, you have any dad to that? Uh, I think that the... Well, my first love is Shakespeare. I mean, that's that's when I I started out doing a Shakespeare contest, and uh, I've done all 37 plays. I've acted in all of them, uh, uh, and uh, and he he still amazes me. I still find things 
that come up. Uh, I'm in, in, I'll be driving my car and going through a simple speech like to be or not to be, and something, of, oh my God, there it is. It's so simple. It's just as, the, the, the reticence of his language is, uh, it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm still, he still fills me with incredible wonder. Uh, and that, that, that there's hardly any kind of record that he even existed. Maybe 12 documents, you know, his birth certificate and the marriage and his son's death. And, but, uh, uh, and, 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 and all this guff that you hear about that he didn't write the plays, and they don't say that about Rembrandt. <laughs> Right place. No, but I mean he's an artist. No, uh, uh, there's there's hardly anything on Rembrandt, but the, well, yeah, no, he's right. he's really something. Well, uh, he, he Shakespeare's not the only one that have, are great artists, you know. That uh, so I think it's ridiculous. And you can also, I also know because the sonnets that, uh, were published. I mean, they were you could before the plays, you know, mm. and. Uh, and you can tell from the writing of the sonnets uh, the, the, the rhythm and the style of Shakespeare in, in the words of, of, of the plays. So uh, he has a certain style in his writing that nobody else does. Marlowe doesn't do it. I mean, everything was done in strict iambic pentam pentameter. Is this the face that launched a thousand ships? You know, Mar Marlowe. And, uh, and Shakespeare broke that pattern, broke the iambic pentameter. And then you have to ask yourself, well, why did he break it? You know, I mean, why? this is the way everybody was writing. Um, because uh, he discovered that, uh, that the iambic pentameter, da 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 is actually the closest thing to our natural speech. You know, <clears throat> what are we going to do this afternoon? Let's go to town and buy an ice cream cone. That, that, that's natural way of speaking, and that's an iambic pentameter. But you can't say, let's go to town and buy an ice cream. You, you, you don't talk that way. So he discovered that uh, uh, the verbs are one of the most important things in Shakespeare because uh, uh, they're the action words. And, uh, and the verbs are words that we, uh, as modern audiences, understand. So, and he says in his advice to the players, suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Uh, that's his advice to how to act. You know? And so uh, uh, if you see a verb, an interesting thing that I, I discovered is if you circled all the verbs in the speech, you know, and then drew a line through all the verbs, uh, you'll find how the progression of the speech goes just by the action of, of the words. You know? It's an amazing thing. You know? uh, uh, so, uh, and I'm still, I'm still discovering it. It's my first love. That's what I love the most. You know? <laughs> I have a Russian acting teacher. I just want to, I told you the other day, I, kind of funny. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Mutalev, who uh, by the time he, he was a very seedy kind of guy, very heavy Russian exercises. You know, is Shakespeare has the idea that uh, it's like the torrent, the tempest, and the whirlwind of passion. And when you're talking of love or hate, the rain is coming down. You're saying, I love you. And then Torrent comes in the tempest. I love you. <laughs> and then he's coming from I love you. <laughs> and the funny thing is, it's not, it's silly, but in a way, you pay attention to the real actors who don't speak in one tone. You do say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Right? It does, oh, I hate you. you know? <laughs> So it's very interesting, uh, the things you run across in a lifetime, right? The, the people you bump into, the, the things you pick up, right? Uh, acting, um, all the little tricks or little things. Tell us some of your tricks. Talking about Russians, like when I, the school I went to, the Goodman Theater, uh, torn down the parking lot, another place. Uh, but the theater itself looked like Bayreuth. That's what it was copied after, the Wagner thing. But the school was run by a Russian. His name was Nyssen. And his family still 
has the school in Moscow, the Nusen School still exists. One of the other teachers on the faculty was someone who had come over with the Moscow art in 26. Oh my. And he stayed. <laughs> that was, and then there was a wonderful, the voice and diction woman, Mary Agnes Doyle. This incredibly, she was, well, I don't know how old she was when she died, but she put herself into a convent and died in the convent. And she was taken into the order because she died a virgin at the age of like 87. But she was a child actress in New York with Charles Froman. But Dustin Hoffman played in Titanic and she lost her voice. And Froman sent her to England to get her voice back, studying with a man named Henry Sweet. Henry Sweet was the man that George Bernard Shaw wrote Pygmalion about, Henry Higgins. And my teacher, she was lived with two other Irish girls. And one of them was Elsie Fogarty, oh, yeah. who started what school? I don't know. Oh, it might have been Lambert. Lambert. She was the yeah, teacher Lambert. of all of those people. Well, Iris, well, go ahead. I'll tell and then the other one, her name was <laughs> Lilla McCarthy. Yeah. She was Harley Granville Barker's oh. mistress and all that. And there was Mary Agnes. And I remember she wrote me when I was doing the Higgins and Summerstock. She just wrote a card. She said, I hope you have a drugstore near bar because you must dye your hair red to play Henry Higgins. Because Mr. Sweet was a redhead. But I know we were doing something. We had, I never succeeded in class. Or I could never memorize any poetry. I'd always screw up. But I did, I had found a copy of Oscar Wilde's De Profundis in some old bookstore which was an absolute treasure, I found out later. And I read something from that. I remember she sat there. And then she said, you know, the three of us were Irish patriots in London. Then I didn't, it came out of the blue. She then described later what then, what she meant. These three girls used to stand outside the Oscar Wilde trials because they knew it was a political thing. And they all mm. were out there holding their Irish flags. Mm -hmm. And they said, we went in to mourning when they <laughs> convicted him. But it was so to go that far back that she remembered all of these things. It was one of those, mm. <laughs> that was the most incredible person I ever came across in the theater, mm. that she remembered everything and you dreaded her coming to a rehearsal because she was in the front oh, row yeah. oh. and making notes <laughs> about your speech. <laughs> but what an incredible woman. That was an angel. You're talking about a lot of the warm, fuzzy moments that you've had in your long, illustrious careers. There had to be somebody really difficult to work with. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to name names, but uh, one of those. Yeah, please do. <laughs> will, will this ever end uh, uh, type experience? So, how you're looking for some dirt? Yeah! <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> uh, I was good. No names, please. The, the, we were doing Hamlet at the Globe, and uh, Eric Christmas was the, the grave digger, and I was the second grave digger. And uh, uh, the the uh, somebody in, we, we were to do a preview performance that night, and uh, someone, uh, one of the stage crew people, saw this boards loose here, which is the grave that we came out of, and it's flat, open like that. And he, <laughs> and nobody knew. And so we, there, Eric and I were crawling along like this underneath, and then Eric's going, <laughs> and he's going, God damn it, <laughs> all these funny sounds. And then Jack is in the, who was directing, was in the back and says, 
What seems what seems to be the problems, darling? <laughs> so we had to stop the show, and, and they got the, the crew came out and opened it up. <clears throat> and then <laughs> Eric decided, I'm not going to go back under there. So we just walked out. <laughs> But there's a, there's a, I, I, I love the people that forget line stories. Morris Karnowski was an incredible, incredible character actor, uh, mm. uh, doing King Lear. And uh, he said one night, you see before you three fingers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, act actors have to cover themselves. I, I was doing Devil's Disciple, and uh, I went up, and uh, Anthony T was facing me, his back to the audience, and I was facing the audience. And then, with tremendous confidence, I, I, completely up, I said, and that's the way it is. <laughs> he looked at me, what, you know, like, so like, all the blame went to him, right? <laughs> I went up and, and that's the way it is, it's Bernard Shaw, right? Well, he picked up the audience, really knows that you've got, uh, he picked up, and we went right back into it again. And there sometimes, you have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there you, you have, have it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes it does happen, you just dry up on a certain thing. My favorite is the Lunts. Uh, oh, yeah. They, uh, they went up on a line and then they, they were so good at lunch, just back and forth and the stage managers on off the side side and says I love you darling that's the line I love you darling it's silence finally it just says, I love you she says we know the line which one of us says it <laughs> <laughs> become a great theater yeah. story. <laughs> the true story as told by the Lunts on the Dick Cavett show mm -hmm. with Noel Coward. They were doing Design for Living on Broadway, the three of them. And they it was a limited engagement, but then it was such a big hit they extended. But Noel and Alfred were getting a little bored in the second act and they decided they were going to have fun with Linny and they thought they would exchange their lines. <laughs> well, they started out and they got completely lost. <laughs> and that's where that comes from. It was them telling it. That was just great. Oh. Well, the other one is exactly ties in with that, the, the lines and nothing, nothing. Finally, Alfred takes out his side of the script, looks at it, not me. <laughs> It is, uh, I, it is agony when uh, it's happened to me to where I just don't know the line and, and I try to, and it seems like hours, you know, yeah. I mean, it, oh, yeah. it yeah. seems like forever and then thank God someone will cover and, yeah. and say my line for me, you know, or we write, we'll write a certain word on our cuff. <laughs> Yeah, don't come up here and look too close. Yeah. <laughs> Bonnie, did you want to ask? Yeah, um, I had the great pleasure of seeing Ken um, play Oscar Wilde in San Francisco, and um, it was amazing. And I was just, I never got to talk to you much after that, but the story connected to the three women, I never got to talk to you about how you felt about playing Oscar Wilde. I'm deaf. Uh, the question is yes, how, the how you felt about playing Oscar Wilde. I, I loved it. Um, when I was talking about, remember, I found this book in a bookstore. Yeah. I must have been 17 <laughs> in Chicago, and it was the De Profundis. It was bound in gray velvet, gold edged, and it was a limited edition. And it had the number in there. And it was, can't even think, Oscar's good friend, Robbie, whatever it was, he had given this to someone named Forrest Paris. And that <laughs> became a name that I always, but I remember that when I was doing that show and I was 
a woman that worked in the office at ACT, she said, I've got some interesting Oscar stories to tell you. And she said, it'll be about De Profundis. I said, read it. She said, I don't want to tell it. I'll give you just the printout. Somehow in her family was a typed manuscript of De Profundis. And she had come over from England and she'd given it to an Oscar Wilde library, some scholars in San Jose, and they told her it was a fake because it was written on an American typewriter and there was a, the print on the paper was American. And she knew it couldn't because her father had given it to her. Well, she gave it then to the LA collection at UCLA and they, it's a detective story. They found out that when Oscar gave the manuscript to Robbie, he knew that this typist on a street in London where they had the best typewriters, which were Americans, <laughs> and they type used only American print paper. So that really was, but it was one of the copies that had been sent to that twit Alfred Lord Douglas, which he sent back and never read. And Oscar said, if any come back, give it to the, the warden at the jail. And that was her oh, father. No. And that's where that came from. And we're going to be doing a play about that. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Just, <laughs> amazing. That used to, I mean, I always thought of that all the time, the attachment to them. But I'm glad you liked it. It was a treat doing it. Real treat. Julie. My question is for Mr. McMurtry, actually. Um, what was your favorite Shakespeare play that you read growing up? Like, what was your favorite role that you played? Or do you have a favorite? Uh, Questions for Jonathan. What's his favorite Shakespeare role that he's played? It, uh, I think that probably Iago. That it was the most, I mean, it, I've done some, I think the hardest role was Brutus in Julius Caesar. Uh, I had a lot of problems with that. I, uh, I didn't discover it. We, we were four months on that play, and uh, uh, I was just going through it, and I suddenly realized that all through the, in the parts, uh, uh, everybody sleeps but him. Uh, the little boy sleeps, the servant, Lucius sleeps, and uh, so I thought, um, I was trying to find, I keep thinking he's Miss, Mr. Good. How do you play uh, uh, honorable? You know, the, the most, uh, what is it, the most uh, man of all, uh, 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 Mark Atkin. No. He's the most noble man of all, what is it? Noblest. Uh, noblest. Hmm? noblest. The noblest. How do you play nobility, you know? Uh, uh, and um, suddenly I found, I went to a psychiatrist and I asked, what are the symptoms of <laughs> insomnia, you know. and one was he has a quick temper, you know, uh, and so I was able to find later s some things that I thought worked, but I could. I, it, we only have maybe two weeks left to run the run the play, and I, I would have liked to have explored it more. But I think it's I actually think it's the hardest part in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how to play nobility. Uh, I played Caesar, mm -hmm. and we uh, we talked about it. And we had a wonderful director, Ed Call. Ed Call. Ed Call gave me this advice, and he said, "Look, uh, I don't want you to play. No, but he didn't use the word, but you know, I don't want you to play." Oh, that. Yeah. He said, "When they come for you, it's four o'clock in the morning, and in Rome, it's cold. Four o'clock in the morning." So, and Calpurnia, my wife, comes out. He says, "You probably have lumbago or something, you know. You bent over. You can scratch your behind. I don't care. She's the only one there with you at the time. When the others arrive to take you to the the forum, he says, then there's that, you know. Hi guys. You don't want to be a weakling in front of those people. You want to be strong. So you pull in your stomach. Up. Hi, how's it going? Uh, uh, uh. Then when you come into the forum." And I had a long train, you talk about costumes, right? A long red train behind me. And he said, then, I've never done it since or before. He said, uh, because in life you don't do that. You talk to somebody like that. He says, just look down your nose. 
And it is, it's arrogant as hell. And it's noble in a way too, you know? And uh, Ray Burke was playing Cassius. And I stared him down, you know? He, he kneels right there and I just went like that. So it's very interesting, these wonderful acting things that a good director will give you, you know? You don't start just playing a character one way. And whether it's Shakespeare or not, you bring something and it makes the character live, you know? That's whatever it is. So. Two more, and I see them right here, these two. Yes. When you're playing a really heavy role, like a murder or a rapist, how do you separate yourself emotionally, like when you go home? <laughs> 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 the other one is, is Dinah, was Dinah Shore as nice as you see? <laughs> so the first question is, how do you separate yourself when you're playing a really heavy role, like a murderer, when you go home? And the second question is, was Dinah Shore as nice as she seems? And those two questions go together. <laughs> Wow, uh, I didn't see a lot, lot of her. I mean, uh, 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 I always think of a dinosaur, uh, uh, but uh, 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 I guess Iago is probably the blackest villain in all of Shakespeare. Uh, I mean, all in all of drama, I think. Uh, uh, there's. Uh, it, it reminds me when I was playing Iago. There were, uh, it was the time when um, that man in, in, um, had, had killed the little girl here, uh, and he was on trial. And, and the mother uh, said um, he never admitted his guilt, and, and all she wanted to know was was did she die comfortably? Uh -huh. and, uh, and she the tears streaming down her face and asked her. And uh, he wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't, he wouldn't say anything. And that's what Iago does at the end of the play. He says, uh, say what you want. From this time forth, I never will speak yeah. word. You know? And it's, uh, and that's the, his last line. You know? I played a child molester once and I, I turned it down. I didn't want to play it. I have three daughters. And I didn't want them to see me playing a part like that. And, uh, they came to me at ACT and the play, an original play called The Dolly. I played a grandfather who molests his granddaughter. I, you know, just unsavory to say the <laughs> least. I didn't want to do it. And then they said, well, Ray, you know, you're very sympathetic on stage. We don't want a guy to come on and say, oh yeah, he, he would do it, you know. I, I still said no. And then something occurred to me. We played to school kids, school matinees. We probably had over uh, the run of a play, we might have had close to a thousand kids see every play. And I, in the play, I thought, you know, if these kids can get the courage to talk to somebody about being, they're being molested, somebody in those thousand kids is, might be molested, then I'm adding something, I'm doing something positive. So I took the part then, you know, but with the hope that some kid would say, yeah, in the play, I feel that I could talk to somebody, you know, uh, but to go near that, to find out, because then you have to find out, what is it like to molest a child? Oh, wow, you don't want to do that. Uh, but in, in your mind, you do, what would I do? How would I molest a child? And that's, you know, then you say, oh my God. And then I found out later on after, it's trust. All these people who molest people, it's trust, and especially children. That's what's so heartbreaking, mm -hmm. to get the trust of someone and then destroy the trust. Mm -hmm. That happens with adults too, but especially with, with the child. So that was very difficult to, to go there, to that place, and say, what did Stanislavski, if, if I were a rapist, if I were a rich man, if I were, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. If, then what, how, what, where, why, when, and how. Well, mm -hmm. What would I do? And then you have to go inside your soul. You have to look at it sometimes and say, oh boy. Yeah. What's the Stanislavski? Know what you're saying and why you're saying it and the how will take care of itself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I know. I just, I guess I've been fortunate in just saying you take a lot of parts that you don't want to play, but I could never do one that I, I either hated or did not understand in, in any way. I, I, I hated playing 
Mac, Mac, Mac oh, Beth. Yeah. Uh, it was a, it was horrible to begin with. And I remember Craig Knoll said, "Oh, forget about what the director said. Just play it the way you want to play it." I said, "I didn't want to play it." <laughs> but there, I mean, some of those. Uh, I've been very lucky because I've I've done the Tempest five times over forty years, and. Lear, I've done four times over, uh, well, it's going to be 40 years soon. And the great thing about being able to go back to that, letting it cook, and uh, finding out how stupid you were at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, those, there's always some line you will attach yourself onto. And you, know, you know that's the key to everything. And then that's what I look for in the script. And like Macbeth, I never found that. And Mark Antony, and I hated doing Antony and Cleopatra, and I had to do it twice. Michael Learned and I did it here. Mm -hmm. And then Bill Ball, he called me up and he said, oh, Kenny, you've got to do it up here at ACT because Michael wants to do it so badly. And she will only do it if you're doing it. So, you know, just, Come on, you just try it. It'll be better. It's a different director. And going through it, opening night, there we are, Michael and I standing there waiting to go on. She said, Why the hell are we doing this? <laughs> I'm doing it because you want to. She said, I didn't want to do it. You're the one who wanted to do it. <laughs> Go. Oh. Okay, I'm going to take one more question. Yes. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what it was like to work with David on this play. Yeah. Uh, we'll get you back here next year. There we go. Yeah. There we go. The best. The best. I mean, it was just wonderful. What a terrific time. Uh, he's the most generous. And you yeah. let us alone. Yeah. <laughs> We didn't have much choice when the three of us started talking and telling theater stories. Well, I, I said to each of them on the phone when we put this together, I said, one third of rehearsal will be dedicated to just you guys talking. Because I want to listen. So that was, that, was, no. that was a given going in. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience for me. There is a, I, what, I think it's an Agamemnon. I, I, my, my ancient Greek is not very good. Uh, Ton Kratanta Maltekos Theos Eumenos Prostiakati. God looks graciously from afar upon a gentle master. Aww. Aww. It's very rare in the theater that you find gentle masters. Yeah. Well, we have four. John, you have to say something. I do. Have okay. To say okay. Kind of might tie in with this question because I want to know what your hopes are for the years ahead, whether it's a certain role or a play, or if it's creating something else, a piece of art or writing or something like that. I wait for the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, more or less the same thing. Wait, is is there any off. role you you just really <clears throat> still? It's hard to say. I mean, I'm at an age now. Um, I'm too old for most parts. I think I um, the parts I've wanted to play, I've played, so that's not a problem. But I almost have to have somebody come to me and say, you know, you'd be wonderful in such and such. And uh, yeah, it's hard because um, at a certain age. You know, it's, it's difficult. There are, well, I don't know what. Um, uh, Beckett, um, <laughs> yeah, um, perhaps last tape, I've done that, but now I'm the age. Now I'm the age. Uh, yes, yeah, so some of the Beckett stuff, maybe, I, I don't know. Or well, the chairs, that's, you know, those people are ancient. Yeah. <laughs> but the funny part is you need tremendous physical strength. So I desire under the elms. The guy's 76 and I was in my 40s. Thank God. It was an exhausting part, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the thing that I'm, I have coming up, I'm playing a, a, a very, very small part in uh, Henry IV, part one, 
but I also teach, and so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the students at the, at the college mm -hmm. uh, uh, working with him on Shakespeare, so uh, I, I get great joy out of doing that. And so that has nothing to do with acting, just uh, but I, I, li I do love to teach, especially Shakespeare. Are you a gentle master? <laughs> Can anything? Um, I, the next thing I'm going to do is the last Noel Coward play, which is called Song at Twilight. It's really about Somerset Maugham. Uh, not a great play, uh, but there are about three versions of it, and I hope we can track down all three versions because I guess when he first, when Coward first wrote it, there were still so many things with the censors in England, but as he kept on redoing it, so we're trying to track down the last version of it, which is a lot more honest about mom at the end. <coughs> so that's, but that's sort of a downer. <laughs> I've, there's one play, I, a, a, a French playwright I adore, Jean Giraudoux, who wrote The Mad Woman of Chaillot. <coughs> and nobody does those plays. And he has written some of the most glorious tiny parts for an actor mm. where you walk away <coughs> with, yeah. you'll come in and say this one speech and he wrote of, of his version of Electra and there's part of the gardener and then he comes in after the first act at the top of the second act and his first line is I'm not in the play anymore <laughs> and then delivers this incredible glorious speech about the world I would like to do that as a goodbye. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all, but I mostly want to thank these guys, not, not just... Tonight, but also for being here and doing this play at North Coast Repertory Theater. These guys have worked on every stage in this country, and to have the three of them here doing this play has been one of the highlights of my nine years here. So I want to say thank you to them for that, too. And thank you all for coming to us.